Welcome to another episode of Victoria's Lounge from the Radisson Blue Hotel. Today we're talking about a topic that literally has become a standing campaign promise every election cycle youth unemployment and how to fix it. According to a World Bank report last year, youth unemployment stands at 17.3%. And to break that number down further, one in every five youth is out of a job. So how do we fix it? Well, I have a panel and an audience who have some great ideas and insights on how to deal with this never-ending problem and get more young minds and hands working. Mudeu Kasanga is a career educationist and the current national chairperson for the Kenya Private Schools Association, the umbrella body for all private early childhood education institutions, private primary schools, and private secondary schools. Robert Atsiaya is the deputy principal for Kiambu High School. He is a counselor and mentor and a firm believer in seeing the boy child regain confidence and perform at full potential. Phyllis Wakiaga is the chief executive officer of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, one of Kenya's leading business associations with over 800 members. Priscilla Kerebi is the business development manager at Express Communications Limited, the organizers of the Nairobi International Education Fair. The fair has been running for the past 18 years. Stay tuned to hear more about it on the show. Remember, hashtag Victoria's Lounge is how you can chime into the conversation on social media. And on this one, I am sure you will. Priscilla, let me start with you. This is a conversation that really has taken over in homes, in schools. And, and I feel here, at least on the lounge, to really kind of hash it out the way it's meant to be. But let's kind of talk about the state of education here in Kenya. Your, your company deals a lot with monitoring what's going on. But what have you observed in your time? The problem with the, the current situation is that we have a lot of um, kids who are coming out of school and they really don't know what they want to do with themselves. Um, we will hear from, from yeah. some of them. And we just want to have a discussion and a conversation about how we can bring together the, the students, mm -hmm. um, institutions of higher learning and industry because I think it's important for them to interact with industry and know what is expected of them yeah. once they graduate from high school or college. So from your interactions, is it that they don't know what to do because they're spoiled for choice or they haven't been exposed to enough? They have not been exposed to enough. They have not had the guidance that I think they need um, so that they can be able to make informed choices. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at some point as a country, we got lost. We We concentrated more on the soft careers. And now I think we have a really huge gap mm -hmm. um, when it comes to technical and practical um, courses which yeah. are needed yeah. in, in the industry. Mr. Atiyaya, let me bring you in here because you're in the schools, you're in the education sector. So, so what is happening in terms of maybe exposing more students to other careers, alternatives? I think let me start by saying, as uh, Priscilla has said, we lost it at some point. Mm. And uh, we lost it because we concentrated on uh, good performance in theory and not in practical. We left out the vocational courses, we left out the practical subjects, and even in the subjects where they are supposed to be practical work, they have actually been reduced to theory exams. Mm. Uh, case in point is a subject like biology where students used to interact with, um, with a lot of specimen. Today, the biology practical paper has been reduced to a theory paper. Therefore, what do you expect in the industry right. if that is what is going on? Yeah. Yeah. So, so why the shift? Why did we see that change in the education system? I think the problem started with uh, the cheating in the exam. The cheating in the, in the exam to get higher grades and the schools are the ones which uh, perpetuated this because if my school appears as the best, then I stand to gain as maybe the principal, or the deputy or the teacher. And the parents also want that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the curriculum has been slowly shifting from being practical oriented to theory oriented 
and uh, from theory it's actually ending up to max. It's no longer what the concept, it is the content and how much I can regurgitate. So Mudeo, yeah. let me bring you in because it seems then that the education system is preparing our students to be degree holders and not to workers either for themselves or for someone else. Yes. yes. Actually you get 400, you get an A at class 8, you get an A at uh, form 4, then you get a first class but you don't have the skills and competencies mm -hmm. for life. So Mudeo, how do we remedy this? We have no problem with kids going to school for 8 years yeah. and then 4 years. While I think that bit is going to be unnecessarily expensive for us, I think the content is changed about to focus more on uh, applied knowledge in, in the curriculum is getting us back on the horse yeah, yeah. That, that, that takes us to where we want to be and solves the problems we have at the moment, which is a huge, huge skills gap. Mm. And Phyllis will talk about it. Right. It's absolutely worrying and becoming headed towards crisis point, actually. Yeah, We've yeah. got far more degree holders than the jobs market needs mm. and the people are being trained for jobs that don't exist right yes so where's the gap where's the disconnect Phyllis because it mm. seems the students don't know what to train for at least where the demand is in the yes. job market I think there's a big gap between the industry and the academia the industry is not having the people they need mm -hmm. and the academia doesn't know who they need to train uh, because it's producing degree holders, mm. whereas the industry is lacking in technical skills. Right. So right. you can't get a mechanic, you can't get an electrician, you can't get a plumber. So those practical skills are lacking and you're seeing businesses actually poaching from each other wow. because there are not enough people to do those jobs in the market. Right. So we are training for something different from what the market requires. Mm. The other thing that I can add on to what has been said is that when we train, we are training for people to get papers, not practical skills. So you employ someone who's a PhD or even a master's holder, mm -hmm. and they can't do a basic thing like write a letter. Wow. Mm. It's, it's, it's that serious. So we've trained people to go get the papers, display them, but actually not have the practical skills to get the work done. Right. So for the industry, it's a big worry because what happens is in that case, you have to go and retrain people. Mm. So you employ someone, but you spend a whole year taking them through some basic things which someone holding the papers they are holding right. should be able to practically do. Yeah, so yeah. we focus too much on theory yeah. and not the practical and the actual doing of the work. Let me get the audience in on this. Uh, just your thoughts on that, the gap between what the job market needs and the education sector just not seemingly uh, being capable to prepare students. What I will say is that the mindset also contributes to this. For example, uh, let's say in primary, I knew to become an engineer, a pilot, a doctor, that's the guy. Yeah. But uh, I was not told that uh, being a plumber, that, as you said, or being mm. an electrician, it also pays its a career. Mm. So the mindset triggers uh, the, the gap between what uh, the parents or the teachers want you to become. Right. Yeah. So it's not as attractive. And I think also maybe terminology is what scares a lot of people because you feel like those jobs of plumber, electrician are informal. Mm. Uh, though they are formal jobs. They are companies that are hiring mm. such individuals. Mm. So why is that that we keep thinking of such jobs in, you know, with such low regard? As somebody who works in the society, it's a social identity problem. The society creates that uh, a doctor is somebody that is valuable, mm. even from the day of graduation. Mm -hmm. But you have to be a successful business person to be identified by society. So it takes long. Mm, yeah. So the society identity issue drives people to look at those professionals because you'll get a social identity faster. Yeah. Because if somebody graduates to be a doctor, the society starts calling you Daktari. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you start doing business, nobody identifies with you. Yeah. But when you do 10 to 20 years and you become a contractor is when people are starting to say a successful businessman. Mm. So society has to change their identity. And that's why they call it the informal sector. You had mentioned something informal sector because that's an area that we cannot ignore. Phyllis, you were yes. rattling off some numbers. Just give us what it looks like. Um, in terms of, say, the manufacturing sector, yeah. the formal sector from the Bureau of Statistics report last year, there are about 297,000 people employed formally. 
in the informal sector about 2.4 million people wow. employed. Wow. So most of the jobs in Kenya are currently being created in the informal sector. Yeah. The challenge with the informal sector is sometimes is the longevity, the stability of those jobs, their contribution to the tax uh, bracket in the country and things like that. But there's a big move from uh, the country <coughs> to try and formalize the informal sector mm -hmm. uh, because we realize that majority of jobs are actually being created in, in the informal sector. Right. But just on informal, what we are talking about today is really technical skills, mm -hmm. practical, hands-on jobs. Those are jobs which are both in the formal and informal sector. People are employed in companies like Coca-Cola to do those jobs we are saying. Right. Welding, companies like Kenya Pipeline and Kenjan and all those people are employing welders mm. and they are quite well paid. So it's also technical skills that are in the formal sector. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes when we talk about it, we don't need to think that when we say technical or practical skills, it means an informal job. It doesn't. You can actually have a very good job, yeah. whether in the formal or informal sector, with your technical skills. And not to put down the informal sector, because it's, mm -hmm. very, it's very, very important. I think, is. like you said, it's bringing it more into the formal space, yes. scaling up what it is that they do, because they do make a difference in the economy and they could do. do that much more. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, you know, because you keep thinking informal, juakali, <laughs> how do you make that more attractive? to young people because that still will add. Mm -hmm. Yes. The government is doing much in as far as uh, making that space more attractive, the support they're giving entrepreneurs. However, I think they're, they're failing a little in as far as the education sector is concerned in that um, the subjects are st that are still taught, there's no emphasis on the practicality of them, the skills bit of them, which I think makes it more lucrative and makes it more attractive to a student who's uh, doing such areas. Yeah. And I think, in my opinion, if that was touched and uh, uh, something done about it, it would be very, very good. All right. On that note, let's take a short break. I see some hands up in the audience. <laughs> we will get to you after the break. You're watching Victoria's Lounge. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. You're watching Victoria's Lounge. Before we get on to the whole topic of having industry engage university campuses and young people and just giving them guidance in terms of what they can do, there were some questions here in the audience. Go ahead. It's all about the mindset. I can give an example. If we do a survey right now and we go to primary school, even in secondary school, and you ask a student what TVH is, they have no idea. Mm. They're going to look at you like, uh, what are you saying? I've never heard that term. But ask them which university will you want to go to? They will mention yeah. Nairobi. They will mention the universities. So I think it all narrows down to our education system. Mm -hmm. We have focused on t uh, the young people knowing that if you don't go to university, you have failed. Right. They don't know, and furthermore, they don't even know that technical institutions exist. Mm. You ask someone, they're like, um, so they think there are small, small colleges back in the village that won't add any value to their lives. So I think it's up to our parents and the whole country as a general to start from the low, all, all the way from primary school, yeah, yeah. for everyone to know yeah. that you can actually succeed and there are such institutions that exist. Parents uh, really have heavy bearing on what their children do because they feel, I'm paying your school fees, you need to get that piece of paper to legitimize why I'm paying that. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get parents to, to change their thinking and to change their minds in terms of what other careers are out there apart from the traditional yes? Were they I was just talking to yeah. Phyllis in the break and I was reminding her, I was asking her if she's ever employed anybody from Starehe. Mm. And Stare has a requirement that by the end of each year you must do this much work. And they actually assist those who can't get work to go and have these two week stints anywhere and everywhere. So by the time these students finish Form 4, they know what the workspace looks like, mm. they know, and they choose their careers slightly better on average than the rest of us right. who go through other systems. Some private schools have started doing it and mm. already the market is feeling the difference in right. the graduates of these schools. Right. So it is doable, it yeah. is very doable yeah. because schools <coughs> can be the change agent in this case. The schools can force parents to think a certain way and to live a certain mindset. If we start teaching our kids early at home in what they are good at now and encourage it and say this is a skill that actually can be a job. Yeah. It is a skill that can actually benefit your future, such that when they're in school, 
they also continue in that space. Mm. And they, that will be a great help for us yeah, as yeah. parents and for our kids. Yeah. And you know, um, Priscilla, we're also dealing with a generation who probably did not get that kind of exposure and engagement early on. They're probably on a college campus watching this thinking, <laughs> Is it too late? Because I'm stuck on a track right now and whatever I'm doing is not necessarily needed in the job market. So how do we have industry engage or help someone like that rethink and shift maybe their skill set to fit what the job market needs? The first thing like every most people have said here is uh, the guidance from the schools yeah. and we are hoping that the private schools association has started telling its members to to consider this as something important for the kids. And then um, we as an organization um, have got various ways that we allow interaction between the different um, groups. Um, maybe at this point, yeah. I can mention that we have the Nairobi International Education Fair. Um, normally, it's, it's a fair to have colleges and universities mm. um, get students. But over the years, we have realized that the problem is not in the recruitment. The problem is in the knowing what you want to study. Mm. So then we have now come together. We have partnered with the Private Schools Association and, and Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We want the students, the ones who've just graduated from high school, and the ones who are in maybe from three and four. OK, I know we are saying it should start earlier, but we can start somewhere. And, and they just need to interact with industry. You need to know what it is. What's your passion, you know? Right. I think the most important thing is your passion. It's, sometimes it's not even so much about the money. Yeah. You asked about how people can now get those practical mm. skills. Mm. We, are learn, we are running a TVET program as come in partnership with the members who are in industry, where we are giving three months uh, internships or apprenticeships within the organizations for people who've gone through technical schools uh, so that they can get the practical skills. Because a lot of what is happening, they go and do the theory. Mm. When they get to the job, they can't work. So we are giving them three months opportunity to actually get on the job under a supervisor who's technical, right. and they can learn how to uh, do a lot of what they've learned in school. Yeah. Th I'm thinking about that young person who they've graduated. You talked about them following their passions. So they found what they want to do, but it's not necessarily needed in the job market. So you have a lot of innovative young people coming up with brilliant uh, yeah. products out there, but it's not serving a purpose in the job market. How do we kind of guide those passions, if you will? Mm -hmm. okay. And then we'll come to you, Mr. Atsiai. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time with young people, with employers, and with that kind of space. And I find the confusion with the parents, like, if I allow this child who has found their passion, you know, what, what's that supposed to, what, what's supposed to happen? So I think there are two, two areas. One is, the, the personal satisfaction, and I think there's always a need in terms of if you create this. Mm. And then now just bringing that into how can we upscale that? And I think we've seen, including, I, I don't know what his name is, Wajala, trying to jump mm. onto a helicopter <laughs> and others decided. I think there are apps like that being made, so there are people who really, you can always upscale it. So that guidance becomes very, very important. Right. So fairs like this become crucial and also just seeking guidance. This is my passion, and if you, do what you love and love what you do and get paid for it, yeah. then I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a starting so place. Yeah. It's a win-win from yeah. there. Yeah. And it's, it's also then thinking, okay, um, what else could you do? How could you plug into some mm. of those spaces? This country, I think from some years back, we used to say we are an agricultural country. I don't know whether we still are. We still are. <laughs> so yes. I think manufacturing, if that's what we're talking about, if yeah. you're talking about the infrastructure, the roads that are being made, who are making those? Yeah. Who's, who's going to be maintaining yeah. this long yeah. after? I think right. the statistics I saw about the number of engineers we have in this country, mm. and uh, you know, it's so little. And yeah. the infrastructure that we are talking about, Vision 2030, so yeah. that particular conversation, mm. the stakeholders need to get around a table so that even as we speak about careers, about skills, about the technical needs yeah. we are all speaking and uh, you know the forging the yeah. same direction absolutely yeah. Mr. and then we'll come to you Phyllis there is an issue which was raised about um, mentorship mm. and uh, maybe on the job training which mm. should uh, be taken up probably by most schools yeah. because if I took uh, a student and attached him to maybe an industry like uh, paint they go there they learn the skills they mm. learn how mm. to prepare paint Probably this is a child whose uh, skills will be much more than one who has just gone through school and uh, passed the exam. Right, right. So it is important we actually link the, the students to the job market 
so that they can identify areas where they can work. Yeah. And I'm just wondering from calm yes. perspective, uh -huh. what um, have you done about the new curriculum which is coming in? Mm -hmm. What is your input in that? in that new curriculum which is coming in. Uh, thanks for that. We've given input. Uh, yeah. We had meetings with the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development and we discussed these issues. Yeah. What the gaps were in industry, the practical training required in schools and what needed to be done to improve the curriculum. So we actually have given feedback. One of the things I wanted to mention, mm -hmm. our conversation is edging towards jobs, but I believe that there's a lot of opportunity in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because these skills we are talking about are skills that can actually help you employ yourself right. mm -hmm. and create employment for others. Mm -hmm. You spoke about people who do one thing and then realize that their passion is somewhere mm -hmm. else. Yeah. They can turn into entrepreneurs. Right. Because sometimes we also limit the mindset of, of young people by making them think they have to get a job. They right. don't have to. Right. Mm -hmm. They actually would be better off if they were creators of jobs and mm -hmm. opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. young people need to see uh, things beyond being employed and right. come up with entrepreneurial ideas yeah. and we can have a society like China or Japan where people are constantly creating, registering new patents. We're looking at numbers, about 1985, mm -hmm. Kenya was registering more patents than China. Yes. Wow. Mm. But today, China wow. registers almost a million more times more patents yeah. than we do. Africa. Meaning in 1985, we had people with entrepreneurial minds, people who are very innovative, and we're encouraging that. Mm. But over time, we've actually killed creativity mm. and all that. Yeah. There are people still doing it, but it's not as much. So we need to encourage people not to think about jobs only, right. but about how they can be creators of those opportunities. Right. Then lastly, for parents, Parents are well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. I think they want yeah. their children to do certain things yeah. because they see opportunities and a future for them. Mm -hmm. So we need to paint the future mm -hmm. in technical skills, the future in entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. so that parents realize <laughs> that these things actually can right. create jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. That way they'll encourage their, ch their, their children to do these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when I did fourth form and I, <laughs> and, and I got an A, I told my dad I wanted to do hairdressing. He looked at me in shock and said, what? Go and do law. <laughs> when you finish <laughs> law, you can decide to do <laughs> hairdressing. Right. Right. So for them, if they realize the opportunities, yes. they'll definitely encourage yeah, their, yeah. their children. As much as they are going to be entrepreneurs, let them do some market research mm -hmm. so that whatever it is they are bringing is mm. n needed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so mm. we yeah. don't, because if I bring something to, to I mean, we, I create something and then it's not needed and then I kill my spirit yeah, because yeah. now I'm like, oh my gosh, now what have I done with yeah, myself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you do some market research and realize there's a need for an item or a product, mm -hmm. Then, yeah, of course, there's Very progression. True. And I think yeah. you deal with that misconception that as long as the youth are doing something, but then they're, doing, they're busy doing nothing, nothing. really. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So that's it's what you true. end up having. I, I think I want to emphasize that point of, of doing your market research. We get in the papers occasionally these stories of a guy who's made a, a plane, a drone. <laughs> and you know you're thinking, gosh, <laughs> somebody else has done this, what not. Where's the genius in that? Mm. You see, this guy has a, a, a good grasp of things right. doing things right. but he's got no concept of, of what use his product mm. will be mm. no, so absolutely. we need to be smart um, i'm glad we're talking to secondary school students mm -hmm. uh, and this is the point at which you, you you get to choose what you want to be yeah and how you want to do it Great so point. you need to look at whether your thing is useful mm. uh look at uber how it started it was just an app mm. look at facebook these guys dropped out of university <laughs> you know so university is not all that it's your brain, it's your mind. And I what think some parents' hearts do. skipped a beat when you said <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's true. I've, I've, I've met, we are being stopped by the system right yeah. now. Yeah. But I've taught with brilliant teachers who never did a thing after Form 4. Wow. And who came to just kill time. Because teaching is one of those careers that many people mm. have, a certain generation have actually done. Mm. And these guys are far more superior than anybody who's gone through any training, especially graduate level. And I, I now regret what we are doing in the education sector mm. because we are locking out people who never knew that these careers are good for them. Right. Mm. Right. Because we are the biggest culprits as teachers. We never tell students, be a teacher. Or show them, it's a, it's a, it's a hands-on skill. Yeah. 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 It's a hands-on skill. I think this conversation is sort of highlighting where the gaps are. Absolutely. And pointing to where the solutions are. Because yeah, yeah. we do have the solutions. And for appreciating this the power that teachers do have. A lot of, especially women who entered the STEM kind of careers, yes. said yes. it was a teacher who believed in me and told me I could do it. Mm. And that's what made the difference. Absolutely. So let's take a short break. I see a lot of comments waiting in the audience. Mm. We'll be right back. You're watching Victoria's Lounge.
Welcome back. You're watching Victoria's Lounge. I hope you're keeping the conversation going. There's still conversations even going during the break, which are really heated and very interesting. I wish you could get an <laughs> eye on that. But we have some comments uh, in the audience. I realized that one of the failures of the parent is um, the inability to express very well to the children some of these possibilities that are there out here. And why that comes in is lack of exposure on the parent side. And I think this is a challenge to the parents, one like me and the rest, to think through what other possibilities there are in as far as uh, um, entrepreneurial possibilities out mm -hmm. there yeah. because we have so much ability as a, as a country to go far but we can only realize this if we open our eyes to the possibilities out there. Yeah, yeah I say this with a lot of confidence because I'm a victim of that when uh, I decided to leave banking and move on to my crafts business and one of the people who was of big support to me was my, mo my own mom and dad and they really really supported me all through to establish my business which has been thriving over the years. Wow. So I think the parents really need to up their game in as far as their exposure mm. is concerned Mm. on the possibilities out there and mm. in turn pass it on to the children. Yeah, I want to hear from the young people just in terms of how that would help and whether you guys do consider entrepreneurial kind of uh, careers. We'll come to you then. You. One thing the parents are failing is on how they are bringing up their child and the pressure they're instilling in their, child, their children mm. in school that such that you may find a child is doing well, maybe in class he's passing well, getting high marks, but according to the parent, he wants the child to, to, to be the top in the, in the class. They are not appreciating whatever the, child are, the children are doing. Right. Then the other thing is that the parents, they should, should, they should detect the, the personality and the, the passion, pa and passion and the personality of a child. You mm -hmm. cannot force mm -hmm. a child to do whatever. He did not want right. to do so the the parents they play a big role in the nene in the development of careers for yeah, children absolutely we'll get to you mm. Mudeo, and then we can have you respond go ahead Mudeo. Okay. we need to change the mindsets of parents slightly away um i don't know how kenyan parents are so competitive like he said it <laughs> <laughs> parents actualize their success or failure in their child right yeah. so we do need to remove this element of exams and i believe that the the competitive the, the the extreme competitiveness that breaks children right. and is creating this particular type of uh, skewed um, um, training. Mm -hmm. um, the new curriculum is doing all that. Yeah. Um, some of us are skeptical. We, we, we know this is Kenya. If we can cheat in a national exam, how is it going to work out where there are no exams and just self-assessment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we did change into 844. So this is doable. This yeah. is do the new curriculum. Yeah, mm -hmm. and someone had mentioned uh, during the break the importance of parents allowing their children to mm -hmm. fail. Yes. Because mm -hmm. that is also inevitable. In life, we'll fail. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do we get more parents to open up to that whole idea of even if they fail, they're not a failure for yes. life. Mm -hmm. They may have failed in one thing, but that should not be the entire indictment <laughs> on their school career or life. That's there was a comment in the audience there, and then we'll come to you. The lady in purple. Yeah. We've talked much about technical skills. So I'll diverge a bit and go into the inner self, emotional intelligence. Mm. I, and, I, and I always go back to child development mm -hmm. from when a child is young. Yeah. How much do we allow them to explore? How much do we allow them to understand themselves? How present are we as parents to be able to actually observe who our children are? Because when they're younger, if you ask my four-year-old son who he is, he probably may not be able to you know, say mm. that very clearly. But as I observe, I'd be able to know this is what he's good as, this is not what he prefers. Again, emotional intelligence, there's a lot of, and Phyllis may be, be able to correct me on this, mm -hmm. there's a lot of lack of confidence. You have you know, skilled people who are knowledgeable mm -hmm. and are skilled, but with very low self-confidence, mm -hmm. with very low ability to be patient, to fail and try mm -hmm. again and fail and try again. And we have a workforce that comes up that wants things happening by magic. Mm. For me, that's a an indicator of low emotional intelligence. Mm. So again, my fear mm. is that we might start looking so much into technical and forget that it has to be a fair balance, that technical mm. has to be top notch, mm. but so does the development of the person. Yeah. Mm. For this person to become the owner of the founder uh, of kayak, you know, a, a manufacturing plant, you need to be an emotionally intelligent person to actually yeah. succeed. Yeah to be able to support a working force. Mm. And part of this starts from childhood. 
So I think that's also another aspect that we really need to look into. How do we yeah. uh, bring up more confident students and individuals? Our schools have become very large, mm. extremely large, um, and, and that impacts on not the academics, but on the extracurricular. Um, if you have a school of 1,600 and you still have one football pitch, that means only 22 students will be playing at any one given time. Right. So we need to rethink um, generally as a country how we intend to, to cater for that aspect. That is not a taught aspect. That right. is an experienced Absolutely. aspect. Confidence is something you show somebody and they get to do it. How do they do it? In sport, in, in, mm. in clubs, mm. in societies, in mm. whatnot. When I was in school, uh, when schools were smaller, in some schools, especially if you went to the faith-based Catholic type schools, it was compulsory to be in a club. Mm. It was compulsory to yeah. be in a, in a sport. And these are the things that you put aside how well or badly you do in academics mm. and excel or just be part of a team. Mm. This is how confidence <coughs> is built. You're in the debating club. Uh, you're in drama club, yeah. you, you sing on a stage alone, you do these things. This is how confidence is built. Mm -hmm. It is not a classroom thing, mm -hmm. it is an after classroom yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are failing there yeah. because right now um, the schools are so large that again it becomes competitive to enter into these things. So you will only become be in drama if you are actually extremely good. Right. So it becomes again we are introducing that element of competition yeah. uh, into these things again. Yeah. So I think that area needs a proper rethink. I think that discussion is going on but I don't know whether it is actually implementable mm. in the size of schools that we have right now. Okay, yeah, great. Yes. Mr. Okay, I just wanted to add something on what she said. Uh, with talent development Actually, what some schools are doing, they are killing students' talent. Mm. If you cannot probably get a B in class, you cannot participate wow. in co-curriculum activities, mm. which is something that is actually, it's murder, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe the school systems should change in such a way that they are able to expose the students to the various talents and activities that they can excel in. It is not all about academic performance. Right. There are other things which can right. be done. Absolutely. And speaking yes. of which exposure, a lot of people are asking, what is TVET? What is it and why oh, is it so important? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We actually have a segment to kind of explain and show you a bit more about that sector. Take a look. It is perceived as the lesser alternative to other university qualifications that leads to high-paying, white-collar jobs. Technical and Vocational Education and Training, or TVET as it is commonly known, involves training in skills that are vital for poverty reduction, economic recovery, and sustainable development. However, for far too long, society has undervalued and minimized technical education, discouraging especially youth from pursuing careers in the field. This has seen a rush for degrees in fields that are already saturated, according to a report by the Commission for University Education published last year. Between 2012 and 2015, the universities graduated more than 120,000 students. In 2015, a total 60,861 students graduated, with the bulk in social sciences. Inter-University Council for East Africa found 47% of Kenyan employers indicated that they have vacancies they could not fill because of lack of skills from graduates leaving universities. Many of those vacancies are in the TIVET sector. So just what are the opportunities in TIVET? It includes a broad spectrum of activities, from hospitality to human services, hairdressing, plumbing, carpentry, welding, and even building entrepreneurial capacity. All roles the Kenyan government has identified as necessary components in implementing several projects in key development sectors of manufacturing, infrastructure, science, technology, and innovation. So far, 60 new technical and vocational colleges have sprouted up in the last four years, while 70 more are soon to be complete. This growth in TVET institutions, government and industry hope 
will boost interest among the youth to consider a career in TVET. All right, so that just kind of gives you an idea of what that particular sector or career would entail. And you're going to go more into detail about that in the expo that's coming up today, actually, and through to Friday and Saturday. But just tell us more about what the students and people attending can expect. Okay, so we, we have, it's two-phased. We have got the colleges and universities that are in attendance, and they are going to be looking to speak to students. Yeah. And then we have got a career seminar, and that's where we are inviting um, parents, we are inviting students and high school graduates. We, uh, the career seminar is going to be run by um, industry players. We have um, in, uh, construction, we mm. have got um, manufacturing, yeah. we have got health, we have got, and in health, we are not just talking about the doctor, we are talking about uh, nursing and everything else that happens in health. So it's, um, it's an experience which we think is going to help in this process that we, I think as a country we need to get into. And we believe that it's really going to help um, the students and even parents because we've said we want them involved to help you, guide you. And once you're done listening to the uh, presentations, then for sure you can know what you want to do with yourself. Maybe you want to be an entrepreneur, maybe you want to study, and the colleges will be there to take you through. All right. Yes. I think and on that note. Yes. And this starts today. Yeah. It started today. Yeah. Um, goes through to Sunday 12th. Okay. So welcome. Great. Open invitation to our Open viewers. Open invitation. Yes. And to the audience as well. Yeah. It's going to be at Sarit Center. Sarit, Sarit Center. Center. Okay. Uh, every day from 9 to 6 p.m. Okay, perfect. So no excuses, people. <laughs> Make sure you head on over. Thank you so much to the audience, to my panel as well. I know we can continue with this conversation for weeks. But thank you so much for watching. There's so much that you can do. So if you want to find out, if you're one of those young people who are wondering, how can I add value? There's so much potential that I have, and I want to make a difference in society. Well, this fair is just for you. So Thursday to Sunday, make sure that you are there and see what you can do to make society a bit better and also add value to your Thanks for watching Victoria's Lounge. Thank you to the Radisson Blue for hosting us. Keep the conversation going on social media using hashtag Victoria's Lounge. Let's do this again next week. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah? Who's directing? Who's directing? <laughs> <laughs>